Kinematics is the study of geometrically possible motions. In particular, we're going to think about rigid body kinematics and the kinds of movement possible in rigid body systems. This includes most conventional robots and our simulations. This video is primarily an introduction to vocabulary and some key concepts. So the first question that you might ask is, what's a rigid body? And a rigid body doesn't need necessarily to have shape. It's just a blob of stuff that is considered to be perfectly rigid. The key about it is that it has a location. So we can always think in terms of assigning some coordinate system within the body. And then if there's some other coordinate system, we might think of as the parent coordinate system. There's some relationship between the two. And so we think here, this is an object floating in a plane. So it has some kind of position vector. And it has some kind of rotation with respect to the plane to give it an orientation. This is only concerned with motion so far, not dynamics. Like this body does have a center of mass. It has some inertia properties. It can accelerate. But right now, kinematics is only concerned with like what freedoms are possible for it to move. The first term there is degree of freedom. We might think, what is a degree of freedom? In this case, we are considering a planar degree of freedom. It has three parameters. Uh, it has the x, y, location, and a rotation. So a planar joint, which is uh, the description of, of the location of an object in some plane, uh, we might we, we term as having three degrees of freedom. Essentially, it's the dimensionality of the system when considered as a set of bodies. The uh, and then we'll see that there's a couple of different kinds of ways of producing degrees of freedom, uh, including things like free joints, but also including specific pivots and joints, hinges, sliding joints, and ball joints. So just to articulate those a little more, let's, let's go through those one by one. So in the plane, it's easy to draw. There's three degrees of freedom. In space, an object has six degrees of freedom. We often think of those as three positional freedoms, maybe Cartesian x, y, z, and uh, three rotational freedoms. And there's different ways to notate those. Um, but there's still only three numbers representing a rotation. Um, that can be... Uh, a, the, that is a very convenient way to think about the object's location in space, although there are other parameterizations. The key is no matter how the parameterization works, six numbers is the minimum you need to describe the location of an object floating in space with respect to some parent frame. So the most common one that we're going to use is actually a hinge or pivot joint. So if I have one body and there's some kind of pivot axis and another body, and here I'm drawing the pivot axis out of the plane of the paper, then there is some coordinate system in, the, in one body here, and there's some coordinate system in the other body over here. And there's a single number that can uh, provide all the information about how those two are related around that axis. So we assume that we know some reference posts where we have a zero. And then from then, one number is enough. An angular rotation around the pivot uh, axis is enough to fully describe the configuration of the system. These actually are technical words, configuration, pose, that we're going to kind of pick up by, by usage. Let's consider another common joint, one that we won't use so much, but a sliding joint or prismatic joint. Uh, you commonly draw kind of as a kind of uh, piston affair. So in a, in a sliding joint, there's one linear travel where two bodies slide along each other. And again, there's a coordinate system in a parent body and a coordinate system in a child body. Um, and then there's a single parameter that describes the location of the second body with respect to the first uh, from some reference pose along the joint axis. And that's a kind of common sliding joint. Um, we do see that physically, although we're not going to, not as many robots have sliding joints outside of pneumatics. There are a few other kinds of joints. There's a ball joint that has three uh, spatial rotation freedoms around a point and no translation freedoms. And some more exotic things are screws and cylinders. But these are the core ones that we're going to think about. The real key idea here is really about state. Kinematic state is this concept of fully describing the configuration of a kinematic system. So for some set of bodies connected by joints, possibly free joints, we, we know that the because they're rigid bodies, all that matters is a sort of macroscopic position to define where they are. And so for a pivoting joint, one number is fully enough to describe its, its rotation. And then from that, given the basic shapes, one can compute the position of every atom, and that fully defines the pose. 
For a more complicated system, there may be a number of pivot joints plus some free joints. And so the state is the full vector of numbers that would be the minimal description for the pose or configuration of the system. So for a, a typical robot, uh, like an industrial arm, which has per top, uh, six degrees of freedom at the end effector, if the base is fixed, there's no freedom there. And so basically each pivot of the robot arm adds one freedom. There's six joint freedoms. The entire kinematic pose of the robot is described by six numbers. And that is the, the, the dimensionality of the state of the system. The next term we're going to mention here in passing is trajectory, which is really just the uh, path through the state space. Really, it's the, it's the description of the state changing over time. So for a, for a movement, irrespective of the dynamics, one can simply think of the continuous change of every state variable as a function of time. And that net multidimensional function is the trajectory of the system. I mean, in animation, typically one uses keyframes to define specific points in time, and then some interpolation scheme to tween between those. And one ends up sort of implicitly defining some fully specified trajectory of the animation characters from samples at the keyframes. And there's a lot of other ways to describe the full trajectory, but the key is it just describes the, the instantaneous pose of the, of the system along time as time progresses. So the most common thing we're going to do is think about serial chains. A lot, of, a lot of robots that we build actually are serial chain robots in the sense that one link is connected to the next. Um, and then there's tree structures where it varies from that, but the basic serial chain is a common structure. So imagine we have some kind of base of the robot. I'm just going to call that the root body because we, we can arbitrarily pick where we start drawing this kinematic tree, but it's convenient to pick something that makes sense. So in a robot, this might be the base, or you might pick some convenient point, uh, maybe a high mass point, that as we think of as the root. So the root has itself some coordinate system. I'm just going to draw uh, its local coordinates at, at its origin. And then um, assuming it's not fixed to the ground, there is assumed to be some world coordinates. And we have a planar joint or six degree of freedom free joint defining the location of this robot with respect to the world. So that's sort of the, the world freedoms. For robots that are clamped to the ground, that might not be exist. But uh, for a mobile robot or just a general case robot, that's, that exists. So, so the serial chain would, would say that there is some axis. Um, I'm, again, just drawing planar mechanisms for simplicity. So the axes are pointed out of the page. And there's some link. And there may be a, some other link. And this could go on indefinitely if we had a long like six-axis robot. So we have to pick some kind of coordinate system for each link. It is very convenient to pick a coordinate system that's located at a axis. And in general, during modeling, I try to do that because it just makes it easier to describe. But it's not essential. You can actually pick arbitrary coordinate systems. And then um, we can then start to design, decide on joint axes. In this case, uh, if we think of some reference pose, perhaps there's a, a, a theta 1 here, which is the deviation of that first joint from some reference pose. And then if we think of the reference pose uh, being straight, then the, then the theta 2 would be some deviation from reference pose. And likewise, theta 3 would be the re deviation from a reference pose. So we've, we've posited here we have uh, three rotational freedoms in the arm as part of the serial chain. And then um, possibly 0, or possibly 3, or 6 freedoms with respect to the ground. So that's a, that's a planar mechanism. That's a serial chain. A planar mechanism, the end effector uh, can have uh, in the plane, no more than three freedoms. That fully describes the body in the plane. So having three joints in the robot actually allows us to get a workspace at the end effector that might, at least for a small region, encompass all three freedoms. There's different ways to describe these kinds of change. There's, I'm going to allude to a, a system called Denevit Hartenberg parameters because it's used a lot. And the idea is that it provides a minimal canonical representation of a serial chain by identifying exactly the minimum num number of parameters. It turns out that our simulator that we're going to use uh, doesn't use that. It uses a somewhat more redundant form of simply describing uh, the relationship between joint axes as vectors and describing locations of bodies. Um, but just to know that that's a familiar term that exists. So the key here really is that we need, when we look at a kinematic system of rigid bodies, is to identify where the freedoms are. And if there's pivots, that clearly defines pivots. If there's a spatial freedom, that clearly defines a spatial freedom.
with that, we can then uh, figure out, choose a, a reference pose, which is some configuration which we consider to be the zero pose, and then start looking for ways to measure the, the deviation of each freedom from the reference pose. And then each of those freedoms ends up being uh, effectively a variable in the state vector. Um, and then the sum total of the state vector would describe the kinematic pose of the system. Those are kind of like the key ideas, and then these will become more apparent in usage as we work with the simulation.